Thanks for being here with me this evening. I'm so glad you're here, and I hope this video finds you well. Brothers and sisters, wherever you are, I want to encourage you to continue to stay in the Word, to stay in prayer, and to pray for all those that are in troublesome times. Pray for the church. Pray for me as I pray for you. Um, let's talk about being ready. Are we ready? Are we ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Are we ready for uh, life as we know it to be different? His, when Christ steps back into history, are we ready for that? Are you prepared or have you busied yourself with the things of the world? We're going to talk about that tonight. Let's, let's read Luke 12 is where we're going to be. Go to Luke 12. We're going to start in verse 35. And we're just going to kind of walk through this scripture together all the way to uh, verse 48. So let's go there. It says, Straight, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes in and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third, finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left the house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, a lot of couple, there's a couple things in there we want to touch at. First of all, stay dressed. Stay prepared to do the work that was given to you. Stay in the apron. Stay in the, the attire of a servant. Don't take that off and think you can go do something else for a, a little bit of time. No, you need to stay in your lane. And your lane is the servant. Uh, keep your lamps burning. Continue to stay on fire for Christ. Don't let your lamp diminish. Don't be like the unwise virgins who did not bring enough oil because they didn't expect it to go that long, right? Some people do just enough and they hope during that particular time of just enough that they had enough oil in their lamps and the Lord would come back, but then they lose their footing and they drift away because they were not enduring till the end. So keep your lamp burning. Be on fire for him. Don't ever tire of doing good. So we have stay dressed, keep the lamp burning, okay? Another thing for the lamp burning is so that they know where you are. If it's dark out, how are they going to know if you're there if you're not, your lamp isn't lit? Pass right by. Think about that. Comes in the middle of the night, spiritually speaking, right? Comes in the middle of the night. Are you on fire? Or are you cold? Because cold, there is no light. When darkness comes, you look like the night. You look like the darkness. But if you have the light, you shine and give off a radiant, brilliant light to signify, here I am. You don't have to say it. They look at you and say, there he is, right there. That's him. I know by how he lives. So, we've got the dress. The lamp, be like men. Be, we, don't, we don't have any manly men anymore, it seems. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door at once when he comes and knocks. So you're anticipating the return. So you're standing at your post. You're waiting for this to play out. You see him coming. Maybe it's nighttime, so you don't see him coming. And he approaches all of a sudden. Or it's daytime, you see him coming, you, you ready yourself. You know what time it is. You do, if he knocks, it's his home. It's his. So if he knocks on the door, and you know that's his knock, he wants to be let in promptly, quickly. Chop, chop, let me in. It's mine. Show me that you're a good servant. Be attentive. Be attentive to the Lord and his, and his will. That's what a good servant is. Think about it. How does your employee like you to be? Attentive. What do you need me to do? How do you want me to do it? What, how, how long does it need me to take? Let's go. I'll go right now. We need to be that for the Lord. Where, when, how, when, and why. Let's go now. So, 
Blessed are those servants who the master finds awake. Don't be asleep. That's the biggest thing about this first part here, right? Don't fall asleep, spiritually speaking. Do not become blinded by the world and fall asleep because if you're asleep, you're not ready. And then it comes and it's gone. Let us in, let us in. Don't you remember me? I, I was there for the first part of my life, three quarters of my life. I was there. And then I fell asleep. And I drifted. And my lamp went out. And I was no longer dressed and ready for service. I never knew you. Oh, that's not what I want to hear. For me, for you, I don't want to hear that. So, then the master comes in, and this is interesting. He will dress himself for service. He came from the wedding feast. Now he's going to dress himself to serve and have those that were ready for him recline at the table, and he's going to serve them. The gratitude from the master to the faithful servants for being faithful to them is that he'll wait on them. What a powerful, powerful thing that is. And then it says at the end, you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in his hour you do not expect. We don't know when the Lord is coming back. So we must not become slack on these things. It's very, very important. Let's move on to the next piece of scripture. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master has set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? <sighs> Excuse me. Blessed is the servant whom the master, whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and he will cut him into pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Woo! Right now, that's a big, big, big problem for the, for the um, wise manager. See, we went from a servant, right? The first one was for the servants, the servants that are attentive to the masters. Now, this seems to be a step above the servants. Now you're managing the servants. You are shepherding hmm. or pastoring the servants. Think about that. We went from the servants to the man to from the servants to the manager of the servants, the wise manager. And notice he just kind of pushes Peter aside here. Peter asks him a question, and he just continues on with the story. He doesn't even acknowledge Peter's question in this. He just continues to say, see, what it's what's important to understand here is the manager has a very particular job. The wise manager who he has set over his household. So this would be like the taskmaster or like the foreman or, or the manager at your work. He's in charge of people. He manages people. He makes sure they have what they need to do the job that the master has given them. It says, give them their portion of food at the proper time. Take care of the servants. Make sure they're well fed so that they can be good servants to the master. That's the, that's the manager's job. That's the pastor's job. Do your job. Feed the others, feed the servants. Make sure they're prepared, equip the saints to do the work of the Lord. That's how you keep them ready. Now, if the servant doesn't want to do that, that's on them. But if the, if the manager is preparing them to do so, that's credit to him. But if he's not... It's much, much harsher for that manager, for the pastor that was in charge. When he drops the ball, what does it say? If he says, my master didn't delay is his coming. This is a pastor that says, you know, I've been preaching for 40 years and I was really, really sure that the Lord would have returned by now. And I'm tired. And I'd like to take a, you know, take a break, put my feet up, drink some things. And he starts to become slack. He starts to not take very seriously the things of God. And so he beats the male and female and eats and drinks and gets you drunk. So he becomes a sluggard. He becomes a violent man. And he becomes a drunkard. So pretty much he's become worldly. 
He's went from being the manager of the, God, of, of the house to a worldly drunken sluggard who is not doing the task at hand and the servants are suffering because of that. And we have that all over this country today. The pastors are not doing their jobs and the sheep and the servants that are under them are suffering because they are not choosing to be a wise servant, but they're choosing to be an evil, wicked servant. They will get their due. If you're a pastor, if you're, if you're somebody who's over people, that should always bring fear into your heart because you know that you are being held to a higher standard because of the task the Lord gave you. So you must do your task to the fullest of your ability and never become slack. Never think to yourself, well, the Lord's not come back, so I can do a couple of these things, you know, have sleep with one of the deacon's wives, right, and get drunk on something in here and just have a party and do the most. No, you can't. That's not for you. It's not for any of us, but especially you out there, pastors, that are supposed to be the example. That's not for you to do and to be that bad example. So you beat the servants. You treat them, you treat them unjustly. You're not, being, you're not being kind to them. The master will come in a day he doesn't expect and an hour he does not know will cut him into pieces. You're done. Now it's time to get chopped up and killed and thrown out with the unfaithful, with the pagans, with those that are condemned to hell. That's where you're going. If you are a wicked pastor, not good. Not good. So we have the servant being dressed, lamp ready, Ready, ready to do the service. Ready to be a servant. That's what we should all be. Then we have the, master, the, the, uh, the wise manager who's supposed to be equipping the servant to do said things. He's supposed to be doing this. And we have the good one and we have the bad one. If he's good, the master finds him doing what he comes. Truly, I say to you, I'll set him over all my possessions. You'll be over more. I found you capable with the little I gave you. Here's more. And the Bible's very clear about that. To whom much is given, much is expected. And the 10 talents, right? The guy with the 10, what did he do? He went out and had it multiplied. Okay, give him 10 more. Same for good pastors. That, that's how growth should be done. Not what we do here today in America. Growth should be done by being a faithful manager of the flock. And the Lord will grow that congregation. Not you. You be faithful. You manage what he's given you and stop worrying about the numbers. Do your job, managers. Okay, I've hammered that home enough. Let's go to our last piece of scripture here. 47 through 48. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act accordingly to, him, to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given and him much will be required. And for him too much they entrusted much. They will demand more. Let me break this down. Notice they're both servants. This isn't an unbeliever. That's not what this is. You have the believer and the unbeliever. That's not what this is. Both servants and the servant and the servant. So they're both part of the master's household. But who's at fault here? Surely the servant is. If he, the servant is at fault if he knew better. I know better than to murder. If I go out and murder, that's my behind. And I've been over a lot of very good men in the church to tell me that's not right. It's not right to cheat on your wife. It's not right to be drunk. It's not right to do these things. So I don't do them. But that servant was told and he chose to go his own way. So it's worse for you if you know the right thing to do and you choose not to do that. That's not going to go well for you. So you will be receiving a pretty staunch beating. Now, it doesn't say that you're condemned, at least how I read this, but you do get a whooping. And it seemed to be a pretty severe one at that. And then, now I don't, you can tell me in the comments that there's something else going on here, but from what I'm seeing, this is a disciplinary action. Now, the second one's different. But to the one who did not know, and did what deserved a beating, he will receive a light beating. So this would be somebody that's under a, a shepherd that is not being true to the word. He's not preaching the word. He's not doing the word. He's not projecting it over his congregation. He's not teaching or preaching correctly. He's lukewarm. He's, he doesn't care about the things of God. He cares about the things of men. So the people that are under him 
and how they're dealing with things. He's not telling them what not to do. And so when they go do it, it's not that they don't get disciplined. They just don't get it as severe. And I'd like to lay that blame on the shepherd that is over them. Now, I'm not to say that they shouldn't be in the word themselves. That's not what I'm saying. But because of this passage and how it's talking about here, this should make every pastor in America tremble because you will be held to a very, very, very high standard. You are over souls, precious, precious souls. We must always stay ready, have our, be on fire for the Almighty, and make sure what we're given, we're being a good steward of. Guys, I love you so much, and I'm so thankful that you keep coming back. I'd love to hear from you in the comments, and like always, I love you, and God bless.